Good, good afternoon, everyone uh, that have joined in already. Just give us a few moments. I'm just waiting for Minister Koya to dial in. Okay, I'm just going to try and add a background to while we're at it, and um, maybe you can tell me if it's the right way around. Is that writing the right way around? Cool. You need it? Just going to send a message out for Minister Koya and we'll proceed from there. Okay, I'm told Minister Koya has signed in. So, Honorable Faya Square, uh, Fijian Minister for uh, Commerce, Trade, Tourism and Transport, uh, Rio Tirikatini MP and Parliamentary Under Secretary for Trade and Export, Growth New Zealand. Um, I understand His Excellency Filimone Wangabada has also joined in, uh, the Fijian High Commissioner to New Zealand. And I would also like to recognize uh, Scott James from NZTE, who was dialed in while on his annual leave. Thank you, Scott. And uh, Kamal Chati, who is the acting uh, CEO of Investment uh, PG. Uh, welcome to the Trade Recovery Webinar. As you all knew, we were going to run this as a road show in New Zealand, in um, Wellington and Auckland. But due to where the COVID situation is, uh, we took the um, decision to run it as a webinar. And there are benefits doing it this way because we have people from Fiji and New Zealand able to attend. Uh, the webinar is a joint effort uh, by the uh, New Zealand Fiji Business Council, the Fijian government, which is represented by the Trade Commissioner's Office and the High Commissioner's Office, um, and the NZTE. Uh, Folks, the travel part is now clear both ways, traveling in and out of New Zealand. And I'm pleased to know that a lot of you will be traveling, and I'm hoping that a lot of you will be traveling to give, especially Fiji's tourism industry, the shot in the arm that it really needs. I've already traveled to Fiji, so as you can see, I have my bullish yet. I'm already in uh, paradise. And uh, just to share my own experience, the departure out of Auckland was uh, seamless. Uh, getting onto the plane, the lounges are open there. So uh, no issues at all, um, no extra burden whatsoever. Of course, you have to do your red test 24 hours prior to flying and there are many places you can get that done for a small fee. Um, the arrival into Nandi and checking through uh, immigration, absolutely no hassles, nothing different, no impositions and out through uh, uh, the uh, Ministry of Agriculture checks uh, within minutes and then to your destination. Uh, I am hoping Minister Koya will uh, enlighten us a bit more on uh, when this three-day um, 
facilitation for COVID test will be amended so people can uh, move to where they want to go straight away. Uh, for business people, this is something that we are requesting uh, that it be looked at. Uh, at New Zealand, you travel for our Fijian uh, folks, uh, you travel into New Zealand, you check uh, out of uh, immigration, you go straight uh, to your place of residence. And um, you get a test kit, which you do on day one and day five, and you upload the uh, results on the website. So I'm hoping we uh, will hear from Minister Koya on that subject uh, later. Uh, interest in this webinar is very, very uh, great. We have more than 100 registrations um, for this webinar, so that's pleasing to know. Uh, we're also pleased to note that uh, the New Zealand Minister, Defence Minister Hanare is in the country uh, this week, and it will be followed by the New Zealand Minister for Foreign Affairs, Minister Mahuta, next week. And that simply shows uh, where New Zealand sees Fiji as a business partner and vice versa. We're having Minister Koya, uh, a senior minister, uh, speaking to us uh, later. Uh, just uh, information um, for those attending uh, the New Zealand Fiji Business Council with its uh, sister council here in Fiji. We're planning our joint conference later uh, in June this year. That date will be confirmed, so just uh, keep an eye out for those. Um, so for those folks that are thinking about joining the council, haven't done so, stop thinking, just do it. And uh, if, if you need to know where to go to, just go to www.nz fbc.co.nz and you'll see a form there. So stop thinking about it. I also encourage all those New Zealand businesses that are in this webinar to uh, join the NZTE. And Sally, who's hosting us from NZTE, thank you, Sally. She will um, put in the uh, chat box the uh, link that you can sign on. Joining the NZTE as a customer is free and the benefits are enormous. Uh, we have experienced that firsthand as a business. I will, uh, there is a space in here uh, for questions and answers. So please, if you have any questions, put them in that uh, Q&A space and we'll try and deal with each and every uh, question um, at the end of the session. Uh, I'd like to introduce our first speaker, uh, Rino uh, Tirikatani, MP uh, uh, for Te Tai Tonga. And um, Mr. Tirikatani is a parliamentary under secretary, which in New Zealand terms is like assistant minister, uh, for those that uh, don't understand the term. And he is the, uh, his main interest in today's uh, session is, is a parliamentary under secretary for trade and export growth. And he works with the, in the ministry for Minister O'Connor, Damon O'Connor. Uh, he has been the MP for Te Tai Tonga since 2011 and proudly represents Maori in the largest electorate in the country. Congratulations. Um, as I mentioned, he is the parliamentary under secretary for trade and export growth. Together with that, he is also the parliamentary under secretary for oceans and fisheries. Prior to parliament, uh, Reno had 14 years experience working in Maori economic development roles, including working as a consultant for Federation of Maori Authorities and working for Te Runanga Onai Tahu within the seafood business. He also led government trade promotion initiatives across Maori business sectors. His understanding of legal and commercial issues is a result of his early career as a commercial lawyer. So we have two lawyer ministers today. Uh, so I would like to invite uh, Mr. Uh, Siri Katini to uh, deliver his address. Sir. The Honorable Faya Koya, Mr. Chanda Sen, President of the New Zealand Fiji Business Council, members of the Executive Committee, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. Tena Koto Katoa, Nisam Bolavinaka. Thank you, Chanda, uh, for your warm welcome. Uh, Minister Koya, uh, it is a pleasure to be speaking alongside you today. As Pacific Fano, Fiji and Aotearoa New Zealand have experienced some hard times over the last two years. Fiji's economy has suffered one of the worst recessions in the Pacific as a result of the pandemic. And in Aotearoa, we are currently facing the peak of our own Omicron outbreak but there is finally light at the end of the tunnel. 
I congratulate Fiji's successful COVID-19 response and the reopening of borders at the end of last year. It is great to see tourists returning and driving Fiji's economic recovery. I also like to acknowledge the strong trade supporting measures that the Fiji government took in response to COVID's economic impact. This includes Fiji's um, um, tariff reductions, investment incentives to preserve uh, Fiji's international competitiveness and stimulate trade and investment in the country. As trade and tourism dependent economies, we both understand how critical the tourism sector is to supporting small businesses and livelihoods severely impacted by the COVID-19 recession. The New Zealand government's recent announcements around border reopening means New Zealanders will be able to reconnect with their Fijian friends and whanau over the coming months. And for business, this also means supporting companies to grow their trade and investment and building new commercial relationships. My colleagues, the Honourable Damien O'Connor and the Honourable Phil Twyford spoke to the Council uh, last year about New Zealand's trade recovery strategy. A key focus of the strategy has been refreshing key trade relationships, including diversification. We must remember that the Pacific is a major market for New Zealand with significant opportunities to grow trade and build back better in the post-pandemic world. Within the Pacific, Fiji is our largest trading partner by far. Prior to the pandemic, two-way trade was worth over a billion New Zealand dollars. New Zealand exports to Fiji were worth more than 640 million New Zealand dollars. This put Fiji among our top 20 trading partners on par with France and ahead of even much larger economies such as Mexico or Brazil. Understandably, COVID has had a major impact. Our two-way trade has dropped by over half, falling to 543 million New Zealand dollars in the year to September 2021. Much of this owes to the collapse in tourism, which can be seen in the fall in services exports, which fell by more than 84% over this time. But despite this, there have been some bright spots. For example, Fiji's goods exports to New Zealand have actually grown by more than 20%, rising to 70 million New Zealand dollars in the year to September 2021. And despite COVID-19's undeniable impact, I am confident there is plenty of scope to regrow our trade and investment and to realizing this council's ambition of doubling our two-way trade with Fiji to $2 billion. New sectors of opportunity are also emerging. The growth of Fiji, uh, Fiji's business process outsourcing sector will generate significant opportunities for investment in new professional services capability while also helping New Zealand companies gain access to top quality Fijian skills closer to home. There are also particular opportunities for Māori exporters and investors to take advantage of in Fiji. Tikanga Māori around relationship building and cultural identity resonate with Pacific cultures and can lead to business opportunities. With a total asset base of over 70 billion and many enterprises active in exporting and investment in a diverse range of sectors internationally, Māori are well placed to connect with commercial partners in Fiji and across the Pacific. COVID-19 has highlighted the importance that the Pacific region remains committed to collectively strengthening its trade capacity, access to regional and international markets, and to regional economic integration. You will be aware of the entry into force just over a year ago of the PESA Plus Trade Agreement. This is a unique trade and development agreement designed to create the conditions to grow trade and investment flows in the Pacific. It is not only about reducing tariffs, but also harmonizing standards across the region to create a more transparent operating environment, reducing red tape, and assisting the development of new export opportunities. Through PESA Plus, we are supporting our Pacific Fano to build capacity, diversification and resilience. As the region's commercial hub, Fiji's entry into PESA Plus would send a strong signal to Pacific partners and business alike of its own commitment to a trade and investment led 
economic recovery across the region. And although Fiji has not joined the agreement, we continue to believe it would benefit considerably from membership. Finally, I want to reflect on the strong foundations of the New Zealand-Fiji relationship. Through enduring bonds of whakapapa, culture, education, sport, and business links. I am pleased to see, uh, as Chandra has mentioned, pleased to see my colleague, the Minister of Defence, the Honourable Penny Henare, who's currently in Fiji for a formal visit, and Minister of Foreign Affairs, the Honourable Nanaya Mahuta, will also be travelling to Suva next week. As our borders start to reopen, these visits underline the strong foundation of the New Zealand-Fiji relationship and our ambition to step up the relationship across the board, including through investment and trade. Our commitment has never been stronger. As I noted at the beginning of my speech, Fijians and New Zealanders together have endured much hardship the last two years. The current geopolitical and global economic outlook is unsettling with developments in Europe continuing to impact international markets near and abroad. But we can be confident in the strength, ingenuity and resilience of our people to navigate these rough waters. And I look forward to us working together in the future. Nōreira, te nā koutou katoa, vinaka vakalevu. Kia ora, Mr. Rino Tirakatini. Thank you very much for those words. I was hoping you wouldn't mention Paisa Plus, but you did, and I'm going to let you and the other minister to deal with that. But <laughs> there you go, opportunity taken. Uh, thank you very much for those kind words. Uh, it gives me great pleasure, uh, ladies and gentlemen, to introduce our next speaker. Uh, our next speaker is the Honorable Faya Sadiq Koya, who is the Fijian Minister for Commerce, Trade, Tourism and Transport. Uh, now Mr. Koya is a very humble person, because when I reached out to his office for a biodata, they sent me two lines only. But I thought two lines will not do justice to a man of his caliber. And so I've written one myself, and uh, I hope it's all correct, Mr. Koya. So Mr. Koya is a former student of the, the best and prestigious uh, Nathambua High School in Lotoka. Uh, that's <laughs> <laughs> Okay, you like that. I'm pleased. Thank you. Um, and he's also the son of uh, the late uh, Mr. S.M. Koya, who was a parliamentarian, a very respected, long-standing parliamentarian himself, and a leader of opposition. Um, uh, Mr. Koya is a lawyer as well by profession. And um, after his law studies, he worked in a number of firms, uh, leading to setting up his own private practice uh, in Nandi. Uh, prior to taking this role as the Minister for Commerce, Trade, Tourism and Transport, he had other ministerial roles which included Minister for Industry, Trade and Tourism, as well as Minister for Lands and Mineral Resources. Uh, before I ask you to speak, uh, Mr. Koya, I thank you very much on behalf of everyone attending here to have taken the time out to address our members. So I invite you now to address our members, sir. Thank you very much, Senator. Uh, to Mr. Reno uh, Tirikateni, uh, Parliamentary Undersecretary for Trade and Export Growth, his Excellency, uh, Mr. Philemoni Wangambada, Fiji High Commissioner to New Zealand, Mr. Chandra Sen, uh, President of the New Zealand Fiji Business Council, Mr. David Dewa, uh, the New Zealand Trade Commissioner to the Pacific, officials of the Fiji Trade Commission to New Zealand, New Zealand Fiji Business Council and the New Zealand uh, Trade and Enterprise, ladies and gentlemen, Bulovinaka. A very, very good afternoon to, to all of you. Uh, must, uh, right at the outset, let me say it's, it's uh, such a pleasure to be to be talking to all of you today and uh, looking forward to hosting you all in Fiji as soon as possible. And uh, I know there are quite a few people out in New Zealand who are busting to get to Fiji. So please get your bookings done and come across and enjoy Fiji uh, vacation because you haven't done so for a couple of years now. Um, ladies and gentlemen, given the current uh, COVID-19 situation in New Zealand, uh, it's unfortunate that I'm unable to do all of this in person, but it's a pleasure to, to connect with you all virtually for today's uh, trade recovery webinar. As we all know, 
the world has become a very complex place and, and sometimes even uncertain. And, and before the pandemic, it, it had actually started. But COVID-19 has accentuated these complexities. And, and uh, we, it has accelerated some structural shifts. While these shifts have presented significant challenges for the Fijian economy, it has also offered new opportunities. So we've had to realign many things. Today's event, ladies and gentlemen, provides a valuable platform to discuss important responses to global disruptions and to build strategies to not only recover, but also to emerge stronger. You heard the speaker before me about how important New Zealand is to us. And despite the tremendous challenges that our nations have undergone, the political, the economic, and the cultural ties between Fiji and New Zealand remain stronger than ever. The establishment of our trade commission in Auckland uh, four years ago and New Zealand's appointment of a trade commissioner for the Pacific who is based in Suva demonstrates clearly the interest and the commitment of our governments to enhance our bilateral trade and investment relations between our two countries. Now, uh, ladies and gentlemen, New Zealand has actually remained one of Fiji's largest trading partners. Our pre-pandemic level of exports to New Zealand, as mentioned earlier, was worth around $162 million, with top expo exports comprising fresh produce and pharmaceutical products and garments. And New Zealand investment uh, projected implemented in Fiji in 2019 were worth about $129 million. Now, I'm certain that as the situation in New Zealand eases and our people are reconnected, our trade and investment relations will further strengthen and surpass the pre-pandemic levels. An effective health response has enabled us to secure a sustainable foundation for our economic recovery. Thanks to our key partners like New Zealand, around 94% of our eligible adult population is fully vaccinated. And we have rolled out booster jabs and started vaccinating children between, 12, uh, between the ages of 12 to 17. This has presented the best route towards fewer restrictions and recommencement of business operations with COVID safe protocols and the return of international tourists to our shores. And in addition to the vaccination, a nationwide adherence to COVID safe protocols by Fijians has ensured that Fiji was able to successfully contain the spread of the virus and therefore reopen its international borders. So with the, with the opening of our borders in December last year, uh, Fiji has since received 50,742 visitors from December to February. And this growth is foundational upon visitor arrivals from only from Australia and, uh, and the United States. Pre-pandemic, New Zealand, was uh, Fiji's second largest tourist market and one of the fastest growing sources of international visitor arrivals with over 205,000 odd Kiwis visiting Fiji in 2019. So the resumption, uh, resumption of quarantine free travel between New Zealand and Fiji will not only have a significant impact on our tourism sector, but it will also drive investment into other sectors, as mentioned earlier on by the speaker, other sectors that include that are including the BPO and the manufacturing infrastructure development, agriculture and renewable energy. These are the areas that we are also concentrating on with respect to diversification that Fiji needs to get done. It's opportune time also for investment in Fiji in these different sectors. So with our co domestic COVID-19 situation remaining stable, we will progressively ease our travel protocols even further over the course of the year. As a matter of fact, we're trying to get some uh, further protocols released actually just shortly. Ladies and gentlemen, COVID-19 has highlighted the importance of having resilient supply chains, which is now a priority for businesses 
and countries in pursuit of efficiency and creating robust supply chains, businesses have had to reevaluate and diversify operations to reduce over-reliance on a single source of supply. And I'm sure all of you understand exactly what I'm saying. Uh, we have actually uh, uh, gotten to a stage now where we, everybody has to rethink where we are. We actually are in a situation where we no longer do business like we used to. We no longer are able to do business like we used to. There is a growing demand, ladies and gentlemen, for nearshoring of outsourcing services, making Fiji a nearshoring mecca because of our close proximity to New Zealand and to the Australian market. This was made possible through the right business environment incentives, a cost factor advantage and some resources available in Fiji for BPO companies to operate out of. Ladies and gentlemen, a sharp decline in economic activities due to COVID-19 pandemic has presented us with opportunities to rethink and realign our strategies. Now, the 2021-2022 budget provided numerous regulatory changes, uh, low and competitive tax regimes, and introduction of attractive tax incentive packages across a number of sectors with a focus on economic diversification, making Fiji a more viable environment for doing business. It's quite timely that we're actually talking today because we're about to go into another budget, uh, a mini budget tomorrow. As as the Fijian economy emerges, ladies and gentlemen, from the COVID-19 pandemic and sets its sight ahead, we have started to prepare for the, for the accelerated digital transformation with increasing familiarity and preference for, for e-commerce and for virtual experiences. These, there are major incentives for investment in ICT enabling infrastructure and services such as ICT cable landing and associated infrastructure, accredited training institutions and ICT startups, and a 200% tax deduction on the development of or upgrade of online shopping websites with integrated payment platforms. With the announcements of the revised 2021-2022 budget tomorrow, following widespread consultations, the Fijian government aims to provide the necessary tools required to further support some economic stimulus. Indeed, there has never been a more opportune time to take advantage of the numerous business opportunities in Fiji. Fiji, as you all know, sits in the heart of the Pacific with strong shipping and air connectivity coupled with modern ICT infrastructure. And it actually makes Fiji a logical choice for doing business. We have set the stage. We are providing the best incentives and a business environment. We need Kiwi businesses and investors in Fiji to see Fiji as their first choice for doing business. I know we are regarded highly. We are phenomenally huge trade partners already, and we stand ready to facilitate and to ensure that we have a smooth transition into Fiji's uh, commerce from a new perspective. The pandemic, ladies and gentlemen, has been a test of our people's resilience, but I have no doubt that our shared values, our trade links, our social connections, and most of all, our shared passion towards sports, particularly rugby, will lead our nations to come out stronger and to recover faster and to build back better. So ladies and gentlemen, I, I don't want to go on for too long, I want to take this opportunity to, to thank Chandra also uh, for, for, for this forum and to welcome all of you back to Fiji as soon as possible. And I'd like to thank you for allowing me the opportunity to, to take part in today's discussions. We hope, look, looking forward to some enhanced levels of cooperation with all of you. I look forward to seeing you all in Fiji soon. And thank you very much. Minister, thank you very much uh, for those kind words. And uh, in fact, you mentioned those many incentives that are available and earlier in the year, 
the acting CEO of uh, Investment Fiji addressed some of our members and uh, he outlined a number of those incentives and who knows in tomorrow's budget there may be more so we'll have to get him back to speak to our members and um, as, as I mentioned earlier we are looking to bring a business mission uh, in June to coincide with uh, what is going to be a conference uh, as well so thank you so much for the time and those kind words really appreciate it thank you very much uh, ladies and gentlemen, as, as has been mentioned already, there are plenty of opportunities for trading goods and services. Um, I know we had this target of two, 2 billion, and we'll all have to be realistic and recalibrate that, but our immediate target now has to be half a billion back up to the 1 billion where we already were. So there is a target there that we need to uh, aim for. Uh, it's it's uh, achievable, it's realistic, so we can do that. And there are many opportunities uh, as I said, for, for uh, doing business in goods and services between New Zealand and Fiji, and plenty of investment opportunities uh, in, uh, in Fiji, uh, as well as, of course, for the Fijian listeners, there are opportunities in New Zealand as well. Um, we have pleasure in presenting four case studies uh, to uh, the viewers, uh, which uh, sort of supports uh, what has already been said. There's nothing better than uh, you know seeing what has actually happened, i.e., presenting the evidence, or as they say, the proof of the eating is uh, the pudding is in the eating. So here are four case studies that we will present to you that will show uh, the ease with which you can do business and invest in Fiji, and the returns you can enjoy. Um, we have uh, we have uh, listening into this uh, webinar uh, representatives of the. Um, uh, New Zealand Fiji Business Council, uh, our secretary Christine is online, so if you have any questions, you can put it there, we'll address it. We have NZTE listening in onto this, we have the Fiji uh, uh, High Commissioner's Office from uh, Wellington, we have the Trade Commissioner's Office, uh, Camilla Ares is there um, from Auckland, and of course we have the Investment Fiji team uh, for Caroline and Kamal, they're listening into it. So if anyone needs any support, advice, guidance, you can contact one of them. Oh, by all means, contact me. I have all the time in the world to help you uh, and direct you in the right uh, uh, places. So please contact us. We are here to support you and facilitate uh, your requirements. Uh, my pleasure now to introduce our first speaker um, for the case study. Uh, and uh, our, our first speaker is... Uh, and Eric Clark, who is the general manager of Higgins. Higgins uh, are talking about the uh, construction and infrastructure sector. And of course, uh, some of you will know that Higgins is owned by Fletcher Construction Company, one of New Zealand's largest and most preeminent engineering and construction companies. So um, I'll, I'll hand it over to you, Henare, so that you can deliver your case study. Hello, uh, I'll just share my presentation. A second, I'll get up the top. Can we all see that? Can you see that? Oops. Yes, that, that's great. Excellent. Tima Koto Katoa, Tima Timihi Kia Koto, our distinguished uh, guests. Um, Minister Fayez Koya and uh, Minister uh, Reno uh, Tivikatani, and, and good to see you again. I think I've met you a few times uh, in Wellington as well, so uh, great to catch up um, again. Um, my name is Hinari Clark. I'm a Ngāti Poro uh, person, so I'm, I'm uh, from the eastern part of uh, the North Island, which is getting a a uh, hell of a thrashing with um, with rain at the moment, so um, I sort of got two eyes on on what's happening over there, and, and obviously um, uh, presenting this afternoon. Just a little bit about um, um, Higgins. Um, we are um, based in both the North Island and the South Island, but I guess more particularly um, also in uh, Tavua and uh, Lautoka. Um, and you know, the, the, the I guess the our mission, uh, as we see it, is to delight our customers and, um, and enhance um, national infrastructure. It's, it's about generational enhancement. It's not about short-term 
um, you know, um, yearly uh, type things. We're, we're here for the long run. And our, our, our mission, um, both here and in Fiji, is about how do we enhance the infrastructure uh, for generations? You know, Ray uh, Edwards, our, our um, uh, Fiji um, country manager, uh, you know, he, this is his comment here around seeing uh, Higgins as a Fijian business. Uh, we've got 95% uh, 90, uh, of our uh, existing workforce are locals. And um, from our perspective, it's really given us some, some uh, great opportunities uh, to actually build with our local teams, um, you know, a sustainable lifestyle for um, our staff and also our, um, their families. Um, this is um, part of our team. We've got over 250 um, staffs uh, based in, in, in Fiji. I think we've got about um, eight uh, expats, but the, the balance of the staff are all local. So um, our, um, our beginnings in Fiji was in 2013 uh, when we picked up the Western uh, Division maintenance contract. And then from there, we've, um, we've gone into um, major construction work. So the next big contract that came out of there um, was the N24 lane uh, widening project um, in Nandi. So, um, you know, from our perspective, it's now uh, almost nine years of being in, um, in Fiji. But the great thing about it is, um, you know, as we, we continue to say, it's around our long-term commitment to Fiji, the communities, and the training and development of our, of our um, local staff. Um, adding value to our customers, um, you know, we had great opportunities with uh, Fiji roads and also um, the airways. Um, you know, we've had the, the maintenance contracts. Um, it's given us an opportunity for, to provide um, solutions uh, to improve the network um, really working with the asset management. So this is really about extending the life of the pavements, um, working really hard in that area, providing options uh, for FRA, and obviously on the airports. Um, you know, it's quite critical that um, uh, the airports and the runways are, are maintained to a high standard. So we're doing a lot of work um, in that area. But what that does allow us to do when I look at um, things like um, FRA's investment in roading, um, the, the airways, uh, the ability to um, get uh, capital um, from our shareholders and invest in plant and equipment sitting over in Fiji. So our latest investment was uh, a new asphalt plant to support the uh, Suva um, roading development. Uh, the, you know, the asphalt plants are seven and a half million dollars. And then when you put the, the land uh, development to put the plant on it, it's a $10 million investment in there. But we know that, um, you know, from our perspective and certainly from our discussions with uh, Fiji Roads and the airport that we need to have that asset sitting there in order to add value to our customers. Um, there are other things around, um, you know, adding value into Fiji. We're talking about in-house uh, designs that we uh, are using um, our Fijian engineers. Um, traffic management, this is about lifting the standard of uh, traffic control and traffic management in Fiji, um, artificial intelligence. So we've invested in, in technology. Uh, they call it um, uh, ed, early detection, but it's, a, it's an a artificial intelligent. Um, you sit the cameras on top of the inspection vehicles and the inspector just drives. He doesn't have to worry about recording the asset. And the machines are actually taught to recognize uh, the road signs and all those sorts of things, the speed, that they're supposed to have there and any missing signs. So that allows that, that investment uh, into, uh, into Fiji. And this is all about providing uh, a safer roading um, network. I guess the, uh, the other thing um, is around working with the local suppliers. Um, so we've got, um, you know, the, um, things like aggregate suppliers where uh, we've brought in uh, teams from our Fletcher building area. So Winstone aggregates, very strong in aggregate supply. And we've sat alongside our suppliers in, in Fiji and worked really closely with them around, you know, how do we get the quality of, the, of that product coming out of the quarry uh, at a higher standard? So then when it's delivered to us, um, the standard of, of um, product is at a much higher level. 
Um, community support for us is absolutely key. I mean, this is some of the areas that uh, the team have been working with. But I think when you talk to Ray and the team over there, they, they feel there's a, a moral obligation to work with the local community. It's, mm. it's part of their staff. It's, um, you know, working with their families uh, in Fiji. And um, that's just some of the work that we've been doing over there, um, you know, around sponsorship. Um, the One of the, the, the key areas that was sponsored is around that Fiji Ironman, uh, our previous manager there, uh, James, uh, he not only used to raise the money for it, but he used to run uh, in that, um, um, in that Ironman as well. And, you know, things like rugby gear uh, donated to uh, local rugby teams, um, donated computers to schools and done some pavement imp improvements around um, the, the Nandi um, orphanage. So, that, you know, from, from our perspective, is it, it is about giving back to the community as well. It's not just about going and then doing the work and, um, you know, taking the money and run. It's about being part of the community from certainly from our perspective. I guess some of the challenges, um, you know, Cyclone Windstone um, it was, it comes to mind in terms of an example. And, you know, we had um, our entire team in Fiji um, involved in the cleanup. Um, the Western Division um, in the northern area of that um, was one, uh, you know, amongst the worst hit. And uh, many of our employees' families' houses were uh, destroyed in that um, in that cyclone. So, you know, from our perspective, and that's what I was saying about giving back to the community. Um, you know, we provided support for rebuilding their homes, along with um, food and water and clothing. Um, and then um, these are the that's um, part of our local team: Ray, um, Patrick, and Dave. Um, the that's an award they got um, back in New Zealand for, from Fletcher Building around. Um, you know, um, the efforts and, and the results achieved during that um, cyclone windstone recovery work. Um, Higgins donated $100,000 to the Prime Minister's um, fund and then uh, also pledged $400,000 uh, to help the rebuild of, um, you know, our staff or to aid our staff that, um, that suffered damage as part of that. You know, and I keep going back to you, it's, you've got to be part of the community um, um, over the years. Um, the, the last sort of couple of slides, challenges, um, you know, certainly now has been around uh, supply chain limitations. We, we know, um, as I think most of us would know and, uh, on this um, session, it's around, um, um, you know, getting that investment in heavy vehicles, getting construction machinery, uh, working with local supply chain operators, building strong partnerships with local businesses. This is not about... Um, Higgins going in and doing everything. This is about working with our local partners, building up uh, the, the expertise um, of our, our local uh, suppliers and businesses. And, you know, the other challenges we all know is around COVID-19, getting access to uh, international products um, and, and obviously the shipping uh, delays created, um, a, you know, a massive problem for us. And then the last area, you know, around COVID-19 was really, um, you know, getting, when, when, we, when we start these large projects, it's about getting the expert uh, support across. We had to learn a new way of how we were going to get, um, because we couldn't get the experts across. And so technology around teams, around videos, around all those sorts of things, the, the cameras on their helmets and just trying to, to um, I guess, keep the business going and work within the environment that we had. But, um, you know, it's, it, it, it worked. Um, I think sometimes we, uh, we think that the old way is the only way you can do it, but you certainly learn um, from what's happening to us now in the new world that you've got to be um, agile um, in terms of how we operate. I think the only other challenge around uh, this is around um, project funding and, and uh, program uncertainty. And, you know, um, it's about understanding the budget constraints, um, the, the source of funding, um, anything that changes around uh, contract uh, pre-qualification. But for us, you know, the, the, the real key thing is around working closely with uh, the Fiji Roads Authority, the Fiji Airways, um, you know, the World Bank, 
um, the um, ADB or, or Development Bank, Asian Development Bank, and it's actually working really closely with them around um, you know the funding and what's coming up. I think lastly, for me, is really about just I guess some of the tips and guidance for other businesses. Um, I can't reinforce the um, local, you know, being involved locally, physically, building relationships with suppliers, uh, adding value to communities, um, strengthening your, your key supply chain sitting over there, lifting uh, collectively. You know, we treat them like they're part of our business, not as a subcontractor. That's the only way, um, you know, going forward, we can get the, you know, both of us working um, together. I think, the, the, you know, a couple more things around having empathy for funding restraints. Um, we understand those, like I said, with nine years, uh, almost 10 years now, we understand how that works. Um, and it's just really having some empathy around uh, the, the, I guess the constraints that, um, uh, that are there. Um, I guess in terms of the wider market, um, just just growing in maturity, it has got some way to go, but um, as I said, I think if we keep talking, um, you know, with, with our, um, our local um, businesses, with FRA, FAL, um, you know, that, um, that maturity will grow. Um, but for us, um, Higgins, we see that as being, we're a local business over there. Um, our teams enjoy being involved in it. Um, our staff, we've done, you know, the, the staff surveys over the year in terms of the, um, the NPS scoring. We're in the sort of mid 80s, which is um, world class in terms of, um, you know, staff um, engagement. So, um, you know, from our position, um, really, really great to be involved in Fiji. And um, Minister Fries, if you're still there, I'm over there um, in April, so I've, I've taken on board your, um, your invite. Um, that's that's me, Chandra. Very short and, and hopefully sharp um, um, presentation. And uh, you know, hopefully, um, if there's any questions, uh, I think we've got a session later where we can answer those. Thank you very much, uh, Henare. And uh, yeah, as the saying goes, uh, do good where you do well. And there is no better example than your organisation, Henare and the, the work you're doing in that regard. And we appreciate that, me as a Fijian, and uh, I truly appreciate the work you folk did after Cyclone Winston. But uh, just summing up very quickly, uh, shows the confidence a New Zealand company has in Fiji. Investing 10 million is a very significant investment. Um, and it shows the business framework, the investment framework, the laws that exist in Fiji, encourage that sort of behavior. So I just take uh, ask members, uh, listeners to take note of that uh, point that Henare made. And, and thank you for your uh, work um, outside the uh, actual engineering and construction business. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, so moving away from the construction heavy uh, machinery infrastructure structure to a service provider, which uh, necessary uh, cyclone in Winston was mentioned. And of course, when you are investing $10 million worth in assets, you have to make sure you have the correct uh, protection and uh, no better person than the chief risk officer and the managing director of Tower Insurance Pacific Islands, uh, Paula Tebrek. Paula, I'll hand over the screen to you. Oh, thank you, uh, Chanda, and Bola Vanaka, kia ora um, to everybody on the call and a very special uh, hello to our very distinguished guests this afternoon. Uh, Tower Insurance is a New Zealand owned publicly listed uh, general insurance business. Um, we protect uh, New Zealanders and Pacific Islanders uh, against uh, perils that we've just discussed like tropical cyclones, uh, but we protect their cars, their homes uh, and their businesses um, against all sorts of unexpected um, occurrences. So today I'm going to uh, just start by playing you a short video to um, uh, give you an insight into some of the work that we are doing across the Pacific Islands. And then I'll take you through a very brief presentation 
about our particular experience of working uh, in Fiji. Um, so if you just bear with me for one moment and I will uh, bring up the, uh, the various presentations. If you just, let me just do this and hopefully this will all work okay. Um, hopefully you can see a blue screen there at the moment. And um, I'm also hoping that the sound will work on this video. Here's New Zealand, and here's the Pacific Islands. We're close, really close. Tower is proud to have been part of Pacific Island communities for over 140 years. Today, we boast more than 100 team members across eight Pacific Island nations, serving over 30,000 valued customers, and we serve them best by leading the way. At Tower, we're innovators, and we're always thinking ahead. It's our aim to progress boldly into the future. There we go. We knew it was going to be high risk sharing a video uh, with weather conditions, but we'll see if it uh, continues to play there. And if it doesn't, we can cut it short and I can share it after the event. Just seems to be lagging there for a little minute, which can often be the case when you're presenting to a large group. I'll just give it a few more seconds and if it doesn't, we'll stop. No, I don't think that's going to work. So let me just turn that off for a second. Do you want to restart, Paula? Do you want to give it another go by restarting? I can certainly give it a go. It's, uh, it is always a bit of a challenge when you're presenting to a large group. It's still lagging here at my end. So I might, okay. what I'll do is I'll share it uh, with Christine and she can circulate the link thereafter. So let me just share the little presentation instead, uh, because what's most of what you will see in the video, I'm going to cover in the presentation as well. So hopefully now you can see a beautiful picture there of uh, Fiji. Um, wonderful. Okay. So um, uh, my role, I have the great privilege of being the Managing Director for Tower Insurance's Pacific Islands Business. Uh, and uh, also I am Tower's Chief Risk Officer uh, for the group. Um, uh, I'm not going to, you will get these slides afterwards. I'm not going to tell you too much about Tower as a group because I do want to focus on our uh, involvement in Fiji in particular. Uh, but we are a relatively small insurance company by comparison to some of the large insurance companies, um, uh, particularly the large Australian ones. Um, however, we have a very unique presence in that we're the only insurer that has a presence across New Zealand and eight Pacific Island countries. In New Zealand, we insure over 310,000 customers uh, across New Zealand. Um, and in uh, the Pacific Islands, we look after over 35,000 customers. So we're large by Pacific Island standards, but small by global standards. Um, we have an incredibly long history uh, across the Fiji Islands. Uh, we've actually had a presence in Fiji since the 1880s, which is quite an unusual thing for a New Zealand business to be able to say. And we've been in New Zealand, uh, we were started by a gold miner uh, in uh, approximately 151 years ago now uh, in the very uh, deep south of, of New Zealand. Um, but our business in Fiji is incredibly important to us. Um, and we own our own premises in Fiji. Uh, the picture that you see behind me is actually uh, our Nandi branch, which we don't own. We, are, we, we rent that space. But we uh, own Tower House on Thompson Street in Suva. And out of that business, out of that location, we run our retail consumer business. So we serve uh, customers directly, so both uh, individuals, families, and businesses. Uh, but most importantly, um, and the most transformative uh, part of our operation out of Fiji uh, is the fact that we also now have a business processing uh, operation in Fiji, and that's what I really want to talk to you about today. Um, and we serve New Zealand and uh, eight other Pacific Islands from our Suva Pacific Operations Hub. 
In Fiji in particular, we uh, insure nearly 14,500 customers, uh, two branches with 20 uh, sales uh, and service staff. Um, we have a fully digitized operation, and that is something that uh, was one of the silver linings of, of the, the pandemic. And you've heard already today just how devastating the effects of, of the pandemic has been on the Fijian economy. Uh, for us, it has been a real uh, silver lining. We did suffer in our business, as all businesses have done in Fiji. But what it did was it really forced our hand to take a very bold step to completely digitize our business operations, which has meant that throughout lockdowns and while there's been other natural disasters that have occurred at the same time, uh, there have been, I think, three Category 5 tropical cyclones uh, in the last uh, two and a half years in Fiji, we've been able to transition all of our team members to work fully comfortably and, and with full capability and capacity from their home environment. So we did a, a digital upgrade, invested in upgrading all of their hardware and all of our software. And that has actually enabled, that was the first step in a very big decision uh, that we then subsequently made which was to digitize our actual service experience for customers. And that's an $8 million investment that Tower is making uh, across the Pacific Islands, which started in Fiji uh, nearly 12 months ago at this stage. We have about 20% of the general insurance market and we, we don't participate in medical insurance. So that's just your straightforward, uh, what we call fire and general insurance. Um, and in our operations hub, we have over 40 operations staff. And one of the unique things, and I think one of the most incredible selling points about doing business in Fiji, is that we have been able to man that operation 100% with Fijian staff. We only have one temporary expat located in Fiji, but our entire technical staff, and they comprise customer service, claims, finance, uh, change management, digitization and marketing. They are all Fijian team members uh, and they are an incredibly talented bunch um, of people. Um, we also provide very important business continuity services to our New Zealand business, but also eight other Pacific Islands from Suva. Uh, and Suva is a very good place to do business. It's actually um, by comparison to Many of our other locations, it's a very safe place to do business. It is lower peril in terms of the effects of uh, weather perils um, like uh, earthquake and cyclone. Suva is much lower risk profile for us. And we do uh, in the region of uh, around 17 uh, to $20 million worth of revenue uh, in Fiji every year, and that, that will vary depending on the nature of, of the year. Um, so why, why invest in Fiji? Um, you know, in 2018, we made a very big decision to actually locate our Pacific Operations Hub in Fiji. Uh, and it was a, a very, very obvious choice for us by comparison to the other geographies that we work in. So we're in Papua New Guinea, uh, Vanuatu, uh, the Cook Islands, Samoa, American Samoa, uh, and Tonga. Um, uh, but Fiji was absolutely the standout place for us to have our Pacific operations hub. Um, and I've listed here a couple of reasons for why Fiji is such a good place to do business from our perspective. Um, Fiji produces over 5,000 very well-educated graduates every single year. Um, as a business, we've proven actually that you can bring graduates into your business operation uh, and, and train them, support them, uh, and have them as long tenure staff in your organization. It's one of the best benefits of working in Fiji is that when you uh, invest in people, they will uh, all return that investment with their loyalty um, for many, many decades. Um, the culture is second to none, uh, and I, I, I gave um, Hanare your presentation a little smile because we can top your engagement rate. Our internal NPS is higher than yours, and it's one thing I want to call out about the people uh, because 
uh, when you're in a service industry uh, like insurance, we are dealing with customers um, at some of the most stressful points in their lives. And so for us, it's incredibly important that whoever is talking to our customer, whether it be on the phone or online or in person, face to face, um, that that person is demonstrating genuine warmth, uh, care and compassion in that moment of need. And we don't, we really feel that Fiji is second to none uh, as far as that goes. Um, we've already discussed, uh, the minister mentioned uh, and other presenters have mentioned what an outstanding effort Fiji has made in its um, handling of the pandemic and its response. And actually the difficult decision um, and, and what would have con been considered perhaps uh, in some cases a contentious decision to implement the no jab, no job uh, policy very early in the pandemic, uh, I believe was one of the significant decisions that was made that has actually enabled Fiji to uh, progress through the pandemic and come out of the, the other side relatively quickly by comparison to many other na nations. From our perspective, we have uh, service providers based in India uh, and uh, we have seen a significant deterioration in service output out of locations like India who have not handled the effects of the pandemic as well as the Fiji government has. Um, as the minister already mentioned, there are significant uh, invest, uh, incentives from a tax perspe perspective for BPO operators. And for ourselves, that is one of the reasons why we run a number of our Pacific operations out of Fiji. Um, the literacy rate and English speaking, um, we talk about our Fijian team very frequently because they are not bilingual. They are multilingual and English, in some cases, is their third or fourth language, yet their, uh, their, their ability to converse with our customers in New Zealand and in Fiji and in the other Pacific Island nations is exceptionally good. Uh, I've already mentioned the long-term tenure benefits. And of course, timing uh, to get to Fiji is incredibly convenient from New Zealand, but it's also very accessible for other parts of the world including the states uh, through Hawaii, uh, and the time zone is very favorable for doing business as well by comparison to other uh, locations in the Pacific Islands like the Cook Islands or American Samoa who are on the other side of the date line. Um, one of the other advantages that may be relevant for, for some of you if you're considering doing business in Fiji uh, is its ability to engage digitally. Uh, and Tower made a very bold decision in 2021, uh, which was that we would digitize our entire business. And in the last 12 months, we have invested, we have a team of over 100 people uh, working on the digitization of our Pacific Islands business, and we chose to start in Fiji. And we are the first insurer to have a fully digital sales and service solution and many organizations have deemed that to be simply too hard uh, because of the fact that there has been an absence of payment, online payment capability um, and, and, and other, other um, you know, barriers uh, to making that, you know, what would, could, could be deemed to be a high risk investment. We decided just to plow ahead. Uh, so right in the middle of the pandemic uh, where our business was dropping, we decided to utilize that time to digitize our Fiji business. Uh, and it is absolutely viable in Fiji. You can reach over 50% of all adults in Fiji through social media. There are over 1.2 million mobile phones in Fiji, so more mobile phones than people. 40% uh, of purchases now are made through a phone. Uh, and 95% of the population has access to internet. And unlike many other Pacific Island nations, we see no internet uh, access uh, issues. Uh, and we are now transporting huge quantums of data uh, across the internet and providing consistent service to our customers. I just want to come back to our people for a moment. Uh, so I think uh, Hanare said uh, their engagement was in the eights. Well, I'm pleased to say that uh, Tower Fiji has the highest engagement score of all of Tower's business units 
And at 9.3%, it is significantly higher than the average Australia New Zealand uh, internal net promoter score or engagement score, depending on the methodology that you use. So in terms of there is no shortage of extremely passionate and well-educated resources in Fiji, uh, very, uh, very engaged, long tenure, wonderful connections, and we choose to resource all of our business with local people. Uh, our management is local. We do not run the business from New Zealand. Uh, we design our strategy from within Fiji so that it is appropriate for our customers in Fiji. And I believe, again, uh, reiterating uh, the earlier comments that the connection to community is absolutely critical and you cannot do that uh, from abroad. That has to, that has to be uh, delivered from, from within. Um, our team have shown great passion for our, uh, our strategy, uh, which has been a very ambitious strategy to digitize our business in the middle of a pandemic, uh, whilst also dealing with very uh, uh, many natural perils along the way. So we see um, there is a, a very positive outlook for Fiji. Uh, the economy is, of course, expected to rebound following the pandemic. Um, and that is thanks to the excellent work that has been done by the government in terms of vaccination rates and, of course, the swift reopening of borders at the earliest opportunity. Uh, we are very optimistic about that. We're not stopping at our digital investment in Fiji. We are now taking great strides into developing new products for the Fiji market uh, that will deal with some of the emerging gaps that we have. So uh, products that deal with um, the affordability factor. Uh, that exists in Fiji. So we now need to ensure that we close the gap between uh, the value of the disasters that we see coming from natural perils like cyclone uh, and the actual amount of money that's paid out in claims. That gap is far too big uh, and is currently being plugged through the, through the government, through international foreign aid from uh, or, you know, the New Zealand ministry as well, who has a budget of an excess of 500 million New Zealand dollars. Um, and, and, you know, our role in that as a good corporate citizen in Fiji is to now ensure that we do everything that we possibly can to increase the uptake and availability, accessibility and affordability of insurance products. And for many of you, products you will have seen have become very scarce, uh, like contract works cover. Uh, for example, which is a very big issue for uh, uh, foreign investment uh, into Fiji to keep infrastructure uh, and industrial projects and, of course, renewable energy projects. They are all at the mercy of uh, international insurers and the reinsurance community working uh, with uh, in a public partnership uh, model. So lots of opportunities. And Tower would like to extend an invitation to anybody who's looking to do business uh, in Fiji, we are actively seeking partners, uh, not just in Fiji, but across the Pacific Islands. We need more partners in the area of digital payment gateways and providers. Uh, we need data providers. Uh, we need property data in particular. Um, we need building uh, partners for the, we're working on the rebuild of Tonga at the moment, following the recent tsunami and uh, volcanic eruption there. Um, so anything to do with, uh, to, with building codes, uh, sustainability, um, we would love to work in partnership with anyone considering uh, emerging into the Fijian and Pacific Island markets. Uh, we can give you access to over 30,000 customers uh, and, a, and a distribution network across eight islands. Um, so we're very, very uh, happy to extend that, that uh, invitation of partnership should anyone need to underpin their own investment into moving into the Fiji uh, market. But I will wrap it up there because I've talked a little bit longer than I should have done. Um, but thank you very much for the opportunity to share our uh, experience of doing business in Fiji. Thank you very much, Paula. Very informative and <clears throat> backs up what uh, Henare said earlier about investment in Fiji, you know, putting uh, so much uh, investment in Tower House in Suva. It's not a small investment, significant as well. Shows again the confidence our New Zealand companies have in the Fijian economy, the business framework there, the laws, and all the resources that you talked about, 5,000 graduates 
the literacy rate, uh, the access to phones and all of those things. So folks that are listening in, all those are available to you as well. You, you said Suva is a, is a great hub. There is a greater hub in Nendi, uh, if you if you wanted to know. <laughs> um, the uh, other thing you talked about the recovery uh, and the economy will rebound for sure. It will. I'll share this statistic. Um, we wanted to extend our stay at the Hilton um, today and to the to the weekend, and we were told no from the 23rd, which is today, to the end of April, 100% booked. So people are coming over. So folks. Go and book your flights, and there are many packages with, with flight end rooms. So just go and do it. Don't think about it. Folks, give me a minute. I have to excuse and take a little break, and I'll be back very quickly. Sorry about that, folks. Um, now from the uh, New Zealand case studies, investing into Fiji, doing business in Fiji, uh, we move to the um, Fiji case studies. And um, it gives me great pleasure in inviting Kenneth Catafano, uh, who is the managing director of um, Traceable Solutions. And uh, this is a presentation in the fisheries agri-tech structure. Kenneth, please uh, address the guests. You left to. Thank you very much, uh, Chanda and Bulavanaka, everyone. Let me just um, share my screen. All right, just checking if you can see my screen, my presentation. Okay, great. Yes. Um, just want to acknowledge our uh, distinguished guests and my fellow panelists um, on this call, as well as the participants that are joining us here today, and also um, extend our appreciation for being invited to this event. Um, here to talk about traceable solutions, a little, a small data company um, that we founded in 2017, founded by my wife and I, and small compared to the last two uh, businesses that spoke. We, um, we specialize in digitalization and traceability, uh, which essentially is um, we, we build software products for you know, utilizing data across supply chains and value chains. And we are very uh, much involved in the track and trace of products through the supply chain. We work across a number of um, sectors. We started in fisheries. Uh, my wife and I both have fisheries uh, experience working in the region. And um, we've since diversified into agriculture, where we track and trace um, agricultural products from Fijian farms out into the export markets. And we are now um, going into timber, uh, timber exports, and also looking into tracking humanitarian, humanitarian aid from donors uh, to beneficiaries in um, disaster affected countries. Our software uh, tools are used in, across nine Pacific Island countries. And um, today I'd like to talk uh, largely about our agriculture product and how, you know, what we're doing with that um, in relation to, to New Zealand business opportunities. So um, our digital agriculture product is called Traceable Farms. We have uh, uh, several different products under that. And Traceable Farms started off about two years ago where we, we now have um, up to 14,000 farmers 
and we operate across seven Pacific Island countries um, and working with directly with farm organizations, with agri-processors, with exporters. And we offer several products under that. And you know, we look at things like traceability, uh, quality assurance, um, tools for farm organizations to manage their operations and reach out to their, um, their farmers a little bit better. If uh, farmers are interested in third-party certifications for organic certifications uh, like Global Gap and, and other types of certifications, we provide data tools that can help um, those organizations uh, capture data that will help with their compliance. And we also provide a, a, an agriculture app uh, that's uh, used across uh, several Pacific Island countries. And really the, um, the um, opportunities we've seen here um, particularly since COVID has been um, due to the, the lockdowns, we were able to quickly leverage our tools and we were able to um, utilize them, uh, working with farm organizations to, to collect data. We, uh, we were able to use it to carry out um, assessments, uh, rapid assessments across several countries uh, when, when some organizations wanted to look at how um, these tools, uh, how, how COVID has been affecting market prices. And so we see a lot of opportunities here. We certainly see opportunities in partnering with um, agricultural producers in the Pacific Islands who are looking to export into um, the New Zealand um, and, and uh, other export markets. So certainly opportunities there. Um, some of the challenges I guess we've faced here, um, the, the company that my wife and I started uh, it was entirely um, um, financed by by us. So we we've grown organically. We started uh, we've scaled it up over the last uh, five years, um, starting in Fiji, and then we now operate um, internationally. We we're recently um, recipients of a BLP grant, Business Link Pacific grant, to help us um, prepare our products for a, a broader market, an international market, and so we. We've started uh, work on that where we'll intend to sell our products internationally. And um, you know, that's certainly been uh, useful uh, at this particular time. So one of the case studies that I'd like to talk about of how a product has uh, been utilized is uh, with Nature's Way Cooperative, um, which is essentially the uh, only operator of a, a high, tr high temperature um, treatment facility, quarantine facility. Uh, for agriculture products that are going out into the export market. And they operate, um, uh, they export commodities, they treat and export commodities, including eggplant, papaya, um, breadfruit and mangoes, and largely going into the New Zealand market. And so they came to us a couple of years ago in 2019 with um, challenges that they faced in terms of uh, the ability to trace back their consignments to New Zealand. So if it was intercepted, uh, for fruit fly or what, whatever other type of um, interceptions. They had difficulties in quickly tracing it back uh, to the origin and identifying the cause of the problems. And that kind of slowed down their, their exports. And there were also quality issues that they, they wanted to address um, in their process. So we essentially uh, developed a digital traceability platform that tracked all the data from farm to export um, and there was, you know, QR codes on the packaging that provided instant traceback um, capabilities. And this was useful during interceptions or customs um, uh, inspections uh, on the New Zealand end. And so to date, since 2020, we've tracked over 1,000 tons, uh, 1,000 tons of export commodities. And this is largely into the New Zealand market. And so we see similar opportunities in Fiji and also in other Pacific Island countries um, in being able to offer these types of digital tools where we can help agricultural producers uh, track their products and um, gain access into markets uh, like, like in New Zealand or into large retail outlets in New Zealand. Um, we've certainly seen the um, the growth or the, the need for digitalization. And this, this was mentioned by several other uh, presenters before uh, since COVID-19. And all our solutions have been grown in-house, uh, built by our team, uh, which, are, which are all locals. 
um, we have a fairly small team that are you know, developing these solutions and starting to um, diversify into these different markets. And so uh, some of the other challenges you know, we've, we've faced is, um, is, is, is in scaling up our solution and you know, finding the right partners in uh, the right markets. Um, to be able to leverage the um, opportunities you can get from from technologies like this, and I think you know, in terms of doing business in Fiji, one of the things is um, you know there are service providers like us who can offer technology or data based um, types of solutions to, um, to to processes and exporters here on the ground, as well as to customers um, in in say the, the New Zealand market, if their requirements. So for example, if um, one of the questions we, we often get asked now is um, um, farmers, uh, exporters from Fiji are trying to access certain markets in New Zealand and they need to have uh, certifications, uh, third party certifications, if they're organic or not, and they also need traceability. Um, of their produce right back to the farm. And so these are very difficult and cumbersome to do with uh, paper-based um, uh, types of solutions. And so what we, what we effectively do is help these organizations implement this within their supply chains so that they can access those markets. We've been doing this in, um, in fisheries for some time. We've tracked over 60,000 fish um, exported out of Fiji into international markets um, as well. And what you know, they can do is to, to leverage the, the story of these products. Um, for consumers on the other end. Yeah. So that's just a very um, short example of um, our work and um, our relationships uh, with businesses that are operating in New Zealand and how we're using technology um, in the agriculture sector to, to meet uh, demands there. I'm happy to take any questions uh, later on, but uh, again, thank you very much for the opportunity to, to share our work. Naka. Thank you very much, Kenneth. Uh, I mean, I'm, I'm sincerely hoping that uh, there is opportunity for your product to be sold into the New Zealand market. And I see Glennis is on the call and Camilla is on the call. And I'm hoping they'll pick this challenge and take your product into our New Zealand market because New Zealand is a big primary produce uh, country. So a op huge opportunity. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, our final case study, uh, last but not the least by any stretch of the imagination, um, and we've had a preview of it from uh, Paula already, but uh, it's from Anthony, Anthony Casa, who is the managing director uh, of the Centercom, and Centercom, uh, and he will speak to us on the BPO sector. Sir, it's all yours. Thank you very much for the opportunity. Very excited to be given this opportunity and excited to be part of the BPO's sector's stellar growth in, um, in, in Fiji. So just to, as we're providing a case study today about us and uh, our investment in Fiji, uh, we're actually a Fiji-Australian joint venture. Um, we're half owned by Fiji Airways and uh, we have, we currently got about 350 employees in Fiji um, and all Fijian. About 65% of our workforce um, are female, um, something we're, we're very proud of. And uh, we, we do also leverage on our, our global experience as a contact center, which we've my, was this first established with my father in 1989. So I've been around for over 30 years. Go down. Um, and I'm just gonna talk today a little bit about, um, you know, about Centercom, the services we do, you know, why Fiji, which has been covered a lot by Paula and the minister, and why Centercom, sort of COVID-19 challenges and um, opportunities and some testimonials uh, in terms of um, a showcase for, for some of our successes and a bit about our people and future goals and aspirations. So I mentioned we're established in 1989. We first set up in Suva in 2014 with about 35 staff as I start and as I said we've uh, currently about 350 employees 200 of which we've grown over the past 12 months so that has shown I think that's indicative of the uh, the opportunity the huge opportunity that, that's come up and in that in that regard our capabilities are absolutely 
world-class. We use state-of-the-art technology and we have got, uh, and that we've got 24 seven capabilities, which, uh, which we are utilized by our, our corporate clients. Um, as I mentioned before, we're part of a global, op global operation. We have uh, operation in Malta, we have a presence in Australia, a small presence in New Zealand, and a large presence in Fiji, in Suva. So with different language capabilities we've got across our group, um, that encompasses us globally, but it might, be, um, it might be a little bit surprised to find out that we don't just service English um, out of Fiji. We also have a couple of clients who are doing uh, French for as well. Um, and of course we can handle Fiji and Samoan Hindi uh, Indian languages. Uh, the services that we provide are predominantly around customer care. Um, so we look after the customers of our clients. Um, clients range from uh, aviation clients, e-commerce um, clients, and that is all to do with, again, customer support. And the Fijians are very natural in being able to, they're a happy people that comes through on the phone, uh, very natural customer service um, uh, for people to, to be dealing, doing business with. Um, I think I won't go too much into why, um, why Fiji. I think Paula covered it, the minister covered it. Uh, I think a couple of the points I'll hone in on um, because this is quite relevant for, for businesses that want to enter Fiji and invest in Fiji via us because via us as a BPO, many international and national companies are in investing in Fiji, building up teams by, you know, through our company. So one of the, I think one of the strong points is that competitive cost in terms of from a BPO industry. We are on par or lower than costs out of Philippines. Um, I will argue that we offer better servicing for that, for that competitive cost. And um, our cost structure is uh, in terms of our 24-7, 365 days capability, we are over the same hourly rate um, whenever that may be. If you need the services at nighttime, daytime, public holidays, whatever, we common rate our charging, which is also, I think, um, uh, that's also quite attractive to our corporate customers. The, I think the other point is that in the BPO sector, and this, this goes to our lower staff retention rates, uh, so high staff retention rates, low staff turnover rates, is that a BPO job in Fiji is uh, seen as a, a strong and aspired to career path. So it's not just a stepping stone or some leap from another industry. Um, you know, our, our success is because we have great people and those people are, are part of progressive growing national international companies. So they are part of the Australian or New Zealand um, company that they work for. And it, it, these are jobs that are aspired to. Um, then that might not be the case in, 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 other, in other places. So why, why Centercom? We, we uh, hold ourselves, we, we believe we've got some, some good competitive advantages um, that leverage off the great government support and, and national infrastructure, both in terms of people and in terms of ICT infrastructure that we've got. We're a very flexible workforce in terms of we have capability to scale up and scale down. And that's why um, that's, that's an attractive thing for especially companies that have seasonal volumes, their, their workforce might want to shift 50%, um, you know, over, over seasonal fluctuations. We have the ability to do that. Uh, we, work with, uh, we work with small to medium-sized businesses that are looking to grow in the e-commerce space, but also national ASX listed companies. So it's where Fiji has really, it's on the map now, with, with the largest Australian and New Zealand companies to, um, to, to use our services. Uh, we've seen a very, what's happened during the pandemic, um, as you can imagine, there's been a very strong uh, requirement and shift to e-commerce. And we're seeing that reflected in the kind of growth and services that we're providing. And, you know, traditionally, Centercom has been um, specialist in aviation and government services. But um, we've, we've become specialists in e-commerce providing, which is ultimately about um, giving a really good customer experience for that person who's using that website, whether it be an airline website or an apparel website. Um, uh, we, we're scored, we, what we're scored on in that regard is positive online reviews or net, net promoter scores was uh, brought up by, I think, uh, Higgins. 
So, uh, you know, we, we are an employer of choice in Fiji. We've got very, we, 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 by far, we're not a sweatshop. We have harbor views from our um, Suva CBD location, which, uh, which is great that a lot of New Zealand and Australian cust, um, cust clients, it's one of the first questions they ask. We pay above average wages. We've got great staff benefits in place and really good staff development programs. Um, we've got uh, two convenient office locations currently in Suva and uh, expanding to Nandi. So the president would be happy to hear that because there's a big focus on, on, uh, on, on growth into Nandi. And we see Nandi as a great, uh, a great growth opportunity. And as I mentioned before, absolutely secure. And I think that was mentioned by Paula is that, you know, we, we've traded through the, the pandemic. We've traded through, um, you know, category five cyclones. We've got uh, secure premises and we've been able to help our Australian and New Zealand um, customers manage their own disruptions, whether that through, through COVID and all their staff are sick at home or it be floods or bushfires, because, you know, these are, these are the kind of things that happen or earthquakes in the case of New Zealand. These are all disruptive um, uh, business disruptions that, that we have helped Australian and New Zealand clients with. Uh, this is, I think I just mentioned that we've also got very, very good staff retention rates, less than 5% annual turnover in the industry. Industry is around about 20, 25%. So doing very well there. Um, and uh, I'll just skip on to the next slide, please. So look, talking a little bit about COVID, obviously it's been a huge challenge globally uh, with lockdowns and curfews and the disruptions to businesses on the ground as they sh shifted to work from home environments, staff being sick and huge volume increases in e-commerce and uh, supply chain disruptions. That translated for us as um, quite, you know, we turned that into a success. And when I have to say thank you, big shout out to the government support that we've received. And I don't mean in terms of, in terms of funding because that has happened for you know, Outsource Fiji Association and so on to help us with um, raising awareness about Fiji as a BPO destination because that has been a challenge in the past. I'm talking about government support in terms of deeming us an essential service as a BPO, so it means our staff were able to come to work as long as they weren't sick, all throughout the pandemic, uh, having a no jab, no job policy, which was just very definitive. Again, I see that as very strong government support for our industry because other places like Australia and New Zealand, it was left up to the companies, which is a difficult thing to, to manage. Um, and uh, again, big shout out for fantastic high vaccination take up rates, which again has allowed us to be able to trade very strongly and, and provide really strong support for our New Zealand and Australian clients. What it also did was um, forced us, as Paula mentioned, um, and I think uh, Higgins is, is Henare as well, is we had to institute work from home protocols. Um, and that led us to, at one point we tested it and we were able to do 100% work from home capabilities. I mean. It's, it's not ideal, and certainly we prefer to have people back in the office, and they all are back in the office now, but it get, let us test it, and we've got that now. So if, if there's a lockdown or if we have to have half our st staff work from home for some reason, we've got that capability, and it's great to know. Um, and that during this time, we've seen huge industry growth, which we're part of. So these are some of the clients we work with internationally. I'm going to call out sort of the UDI. Uh, which is one of the case studies I wanted to take you through. They are a successful e-commerce apparel company out of Australia, but sell internationally. We have a $250 million worth of sales. I'm not sure if any of you are aware of this product. It's like a wearable blanket, extremely popular. If you've got kids, they might have ordered one. Um, and they're internationally based out of Australia. They're looking to diversify. We took we took on um, Verdi as a client during the pandemic. They're looking to diversify their existing customer service structure, existing teams in the Philippines and Australia, and where they're, I guess, paying a premium. And they took, we, we, uh, we started working together and we've been growing together during this time. And I think what, they, what we've been able to bring to the party there is uh, an affordable um, customer service structure. It's very efficient extremely flexible, as I mentioned before, scaling up, scaling down to meet seasonable requirements, 
24 7 got a bit of typo there sorry about that but uh, it feels like we're working 25 hours a day sometimes so i'll run with that but we're very um you know giving that um opportunity and we believe we've helped them expand their global capability so we are out of fiji servicing um, their sales for customers also into europe asia uk um and and, and has given us impetus to actually spread out we've actually taken on more clients into the uk which also have that cultural connectivity you know via commonwealth country english speaking or play rugby that all extends to you know, other countries as well as new zealand australia like i said uk as well all part of the commonwealth so next slide so just put up some pictures there because it's all about our people and the wonderful office environment you can see it's spacious in the top right hand corner of picture you can see we've got views over suva harbour we're not a sweatshop we are a, a wonderful work environment and place to live and I, I would dare say that it's a much nicer work environments for you know call centers that might exist in australia or new zealand um so uh, our future goals and aspirations like i said president you might be happy to hear that we're, we're looking at nandy as our expansion location um it's certainly the reason that's being driven is uh, not just to keep you happy, President, but um, we think that that is quite a saleable proposition to Australia and New Zealand clients, uh, because yes, it's a three, four hour flight um, from Australia and New Zealand, but Suva is an extra four hours to get to. So we, we see that as uh, quite attractive and convenient for New Zealand companies. They can pop over, they can see their team and then go on holiday, which is again, one of our sell one of our unique propositions as as uh, inviting companies to come to Fiji come see your team then take a holiday we're adding to our scope of services because we also do payroll and document management in Malta so we're bringing that expertise across to Fiji and we're very glad that uh, the Fijian government has supported with um, adding tertiary education which is very important adding specific courses around um, BPO as a career, right? That's crucial. So that's now already started, it's in the pipeline and we're working together with the tertiary education um, universities, that, uh, university in Suva to make sure those courses are geared towards our needs and the needs of Australian and New Zealand customers. Also working with Fiji, um, Outsource Fiji for awareness campaigns, uh, which this is part of doing this uh, webinar today and um, enhancing our capabilities as, as Fiji overall, not just about Cinecom, but Fiji as an e-commerce specialty driven hub because we're seeing great success there. And we think that is very scalable with the growth of e-commerce in New Zealand, Australia and globally. So that's it pretty much. I'm sorry if I was speaking quickly, I was just trying to wrap, but put it, push it all into my 10 minute slot. So Vinaka, if you want to know anything more about us, you can contact uh, Carol, it's our CEO, he was in Fiji, and myself, I'm based out of Australia, but I'll be, I was in Fiji uh, 10 days ago, and I'll be back up in Fiji this Friday. So um, please come on a plane, it's very easy to get to Fiji, and we'd be absolutely happy to show you around our, uh, our wonderful office. Vinaka. Oh, Vinaka Vaklevu, Anthony. Now, that was excellent. Uh, one of the uh, participants uh, is clapping at you with, this, with a symbol, and, uh, and the comment was amazing. So you did very well. There you go. Uh, but I'm pleased to see that we have uh, this uh, education scheme for the BPO sector. I was going to say that, but you said it before me. Well done. I, I really think there is scope for that now. And, uh, you know, also very pleased to see because you have a high... Uh, I would say semi-skilled to sort of uh, professional qualifications and you know uh, following on from the ethos displayed by our other two New Zealand companies um, it's very pleasing to see that you have also got a very strong uh, uh, ethos with, uh, which is evident in the less than five percent uh, turnover compared to uh, 20 to 25 so excellent I'm very pleased uh, that you're not delivering a good service you are delivering it uh, very well with the people you work with. That That is absolutely vital, your most important asset, and you're looking after that. And yeah, this is the ethos we are expecting from our foreign companies. Thank you for that. Um, 
to, to everyone, uh, before we go to the questions, Tenakoe, uh, Binaka Bakelebu, and a big thank you to the two ministerial speakers, to the panelists, and all you listeners for taking part in this uh, webinar. Uh, we, um, we packed in quite a lot uh, in a webinar, and it's good to see many of you are still hanging in there, and we'll share the presentation or the recording with you uh, afterwards. We have three questions. Sorry, I've been corrected. The comment was from... Ah, these people trying to confuse me. The comment was from Carol. Okay. But the claps was from uh, Camilla. So I have three questions. Uh, first question is from Glennis Miller. Thank you, Glennis, for joining in. Glennis uh, Miller is the Trade Commissioner for PTNI, Pacific Trade and Invest. And uh, Glennis' question is directed to Mr. Henare um, at Higgins. What percentage of Higgins is local content apart from personnel? How much of your business sources locally versus overseas? Okay, um, so I just need to try and understand the first part of the question, but let me answer the second part in terms of uh, importing material into Fiji. Uh, the only product that we bring in there will be uh, bitumen. So bitumen is, is imported um, and it's not um, from NZ, it's normally from uh, either Singapore or um, um, you know, in terms of uh, the bitumen markets themselves, but everything else in terms of products are uh, local. So all your aggregates, uh, the concrete, um, all of those sorts of things are uh, local. So the only the only real um, things that we we import, and that's the same. Uh, we don't import from New Zealand. They're normally from um, out of Europe. They they are products that are uh, put into um, the binders to uh, strengthen them. But other than that, um, everything is um, is purchased locally from from suppliers. So when we when we're doing footpaths and curbing. We will use local subcontractors who have concrete plants there to supply that product. Um, I think, in terms of the mix of um, local labour versus expats, um, I think I'd said there was uh, about eight expats out of our total staff, and the balance are all local Fiji um, in terms of our workforce. Thank you, Henari. In fact, just to add to that, bitumen has to be important because we don't make that in Fiji. So, yeah. uh, the, I have two more questions from, uh, I don't know who, they're anonymous. But, uh, and please panelists, help me answer this. Uh, the first question is, keen to hear about tangible projects that support Maori and Pacifica business Aotearoa with Fiji businesses and both its growing sectors in tourism, technology, and outsourcing sectors. Please share with us what roadmap we have in place. Have I got a volunteer to answer that question? Or if you want me to read it again, I'll read it again. I'll, I'll oh, give it a go. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, uh, Thank you. Uh, thank you, Chanda. Um, I, I think in terms of uh, the Maori economy, um, I think, uh, as I've mentioned, there's, there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of um, export industries or export companies uh, in the Maori space that are Maori owned. Um, a lot of them, though, are um, maybe sort of uh, food and beverage based and uh, maybe uh, focused into other international markets. But what, what I would like to do in terms of my role that I have is to uh, really look at um, those capable, committed um, New Zealand exporters, Maori exporters, uh, to 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 uh, you know have a have a good look in in terms of some uh, a market uh, tour or, or or investigations or or just some connections that can be formed. And I know NZTE is very active in that space, working with New Zealand companies. Uh, and I think that's one thing that hasn't really been properly sort of um, 
fleshed out is the the the, the potential for um, commerce, the potential for for for, for business uh, between um, the the New Zealand export companies uh, to 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 the Fijian market and vice versa, and also the exchange of um, of uh, just just uh, uh, sharing experiences uh, in business. I, I think. Uh, as, as has come through from, from all of the participants today, um, it, it really is all about the relationships that are formed. And um, I would certainly like to encourage whoever, you know, that we can um, attract to, to, to look at forming business relationships with Fiji, that they are committed long-term, that, that, you know, it's all about, um, you know, just lifting up the locals, no matter what, what uh, and, and as has, has been evidenced by all, the, all of the companies, they have very strong local relationships. They invest locally. Uh, they they help train and you know raise the standard of living, but also through a whole 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 host of other uh, means, they're really committed to the market. And uh, you know, if I can assemble a, a like-minded group uh, from Aotearoa uh, in the Maori space, I, I certainly wouldn't would would be very keen to to advocate and to to lead something in that uh, in that area between between Fiji and Aotearoa. Thank uh, you, Mr. Tirikatini, for that. That's really interesting. Uh, back in 2019, um, PCF, uh, which is in its, uh, I guess, rediscovering itself, Pacific Cooperation Foundation, was, uh, there was a, a delegation led uh, with us to Fiji. And uh, the objective of that delegation was to see how the Tangata Fenua uh, and the Itauki people could work together, especially utilizing the land. There's a lot of land here in Fiji, and of course there's land there. And there was talk about having a partnership with the two uh, peoples of the land to, to uh, you know, get more out of the land. Of course, uh, the CEO at that time was John Mann at PCF, he's moved on. And I think with him, uh, the project has come to a stall. So I take your offer. And I will make sure that we uh, and encourage participants to uh, get together and, and we pick up from where this task was left. Thank you. Oh, certainly. Um, I, have another... I would like to do that because uh, I actually led a project with the PCF even before that, back in 2010, I believe, 29. Oh. Uh, I took a group of Maori land administrators, uh, uh, very successful land-based groups to Papua New Guinea. And we did a very uh, uh, sharing experiences and did a lot of those connections there. Unfortunately, it was an absolute wonderful uh, uh, success, uh, but, but it has to be sustained. They have to continue yes. those interactions and they have to continue to invest in the market just like all of the um, participant companies have demonstrated today. Uh, so I'm uh, very, very keen to, to, to champion that uh, okay. uh, tender. Kia ora. Uh, opportunity is there and we'll take on and, and cultivate it. Thank you, sir. Uh, we have one more question, last question, folks, and uh, we can let you all go. Uh, cutting high tariffs on imports gives countries an opportunity to make industry more efficient and competitive. Agree? and thus to boost growth and living standards. But this process inevitably creates some losers as well as winners. In the mud rush to chase new market opportunities, is there scope to support MSMEs and the outsourcing sector in Fiji Tikanga values? Seems to me this has been directed at you as well, uh, sir. I'll, I'll read it out again. Um, I don't have my, I, I missed the questions. So, sorry, sorry, I no, I, sorry I, I, I'll, I'll repeat it. So, uh, is there scope to support micro, small, medium enterprises and the out sector, outsourcing sector in Fiji, Tikanga values? I mean, it doesn't read quite like a question, but. Yeah, uh, look, I, I, I'm sure there is scope, but. Uh, I would go back to the point that um, New Zealand-based Aotearoa uh, companies will have to have the capability and they have to actually be committed to the market long, you know, to be able to, um, you know, to, to really um, uh, prosper long term. Uh, I, I wouldn't be interested in people that are fair weather friends, you know, to, to you know, here one day, gone the next. 
uh, there has to be, uh, but there is a lot of a big, a big Fijian expat community here in Aotearoa. There is a lot of um, uh, connections. We are all Polynesian. We're all Pacific. Uh, and I believe that, uh, you know, through those connections and what has been demonstrated by the panelists today, they have demonstrated that they are supporting not only the locals, but but all the economic multipliers that emanate from all the business that they do uh, uh, locally in Fiji. And I think um, what I'm really excited by is the, the, the technology, um, the, the uptake of technology. Uh, my partner, she's from Fiji and uh, my goodness, the, the use of um, the digital technologies is probably, probably Man, they're on TikTok. They're doing everything. You know, they they are very well advanced in terms of, of um, yeah, just the use of technology. And I believe um, that will be a huge, huge uh, competitive advantage. I believe in terms of the uh, um, harnessing that within uh, the, the the local uh, uh, Fijian small micro enterprise and small businesses and and. Uh, you know, it's such as what Kenneth demonstrated with his um, smart business that he's got, that he has there with traceability. So I, I, I've got every confidence that, you know, making those connections with um, Aotearoa New Zealand, like-minded, committed, capable businesses, um, great things can happen. And I'm, I'm very keen to uh, lead, lead some projects in that regard. Thank you very much. Uh, last question, folks. Uh, it's from a William Egoniali, uh, and it is, uh, is there a New Zealand business directory listings available for potential exporters or importer agriculture sectors that we as Fijian business entrepreneur can refer to for connection? Uh, join the New Zealand Fiji Business Council. Uh, William would be my answer to that. And we'll direct you from there onwards. Uh, so uh, just uh, one more thing, uh, Mr. Tirekatini, you said uh, Polynesian. Now, as uh, the Minister for State uh, for Trade and Export Growth, uh, uh, Phil Twyford said, Pacific is in our DNA. The New Zealanders have Pacifica in their DNA. And uh, that was the comment from one of our ministers. And um, the other comment I'd make, you mentioned we are all Polynesians. Now, uh, Fiji is primarily Melanesian, but Fiji is the only country in the Pacific, probably in the world, that has the three races, Macronesians, Melanesians, and Polynesians. And with that, Noreira, Tenakato, Tenakato, Kiakahaya, Chora, Fiji Relationships, Katoa. Thank you very much. Kia ora. Kia ora.